The secret to spiritual boldness. Hi, welcome to today's little lesson, and thank you so very much for joining me once again. We are continuing on today's little lesson, our journey through the book of Acts, a series which we've titled, Let's Experience the Book of Acts. And I am so thrilled to tell you that for quite a few years I've been experiencing the book of Acts. Um, I, I can't say that I've experienced it to the fullness that I desire to experience it, but boy, I certainly have enjoyed the ride. And certainly parts of the supernatural elements that we read in the book of Acts I've experienced them. I've experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And I speak in other tongues every day of my life. I might have skipped some days, but just about every single day, I think anyways. And uh, it's supernatural. Praise God. It's biblical. Praise God. Jesus talked about it. It's mentioned time and time again, you know, in the book of Acts. And I feel so sorry for all the Christians that deny that or have never experienced that supernatural component to life in Christ. It's absolutely wonderful. Every time that we see in the book of Acts, I'm going to be talking about it, encouraging you to pray with faith to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit so you can experience the book of Acts, to, at least to that degree. Okay, and um, it, it's it's absolutely marvelous. So um, we want to experience the Book of Acts, and God has given us the Book of Acts so we can know what we want to experience. Amen. Why should the early Christians have all the blessing and fun? Okay, so we've been in Acts chapter four, and after this great miracle of healing the lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple by Peter through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Peter and John brought on trial with the man over 40, never walked, now walking and leaping and praising God. Before the Sanhedrin, Peter, anointed by the Holy Spirit, gives a, a, a convicting message, but it has no effect on the leaders. Because if you're going to experience the book of Acts, I told you on our previous little lesson, you're going to experience persecution and from religious leaders. It comes with the package. Okay, and I want all the good things, you know, from the, from the book of Acts. I don't want persecution, but it, you can't get away from that. And I've experienced, and I'm experienced, even as I'm talking to you right now, persecution from religious leaders. I talked about in the previous little lesson about how we get persecuted by Amish religious leaders, because we send out a magazine every quarter. And this is the year, I'm filming this in the year 2024. And it goes out to about 60,000 Amish households. And um, you, everyone thinks the Amish people are all just wonderful Christians. But in reality, they are just steeped in religious tradition, which is really their idol. And they do all the things they do because they think they have to do them to get to heaven. And that's why they're driving buggies and dressing like they do and so forth, because they're obeying their parents who obeyed their parents who obeyed their parents. And they never change. And, and um, there's infighting within them. You know, there's a, uh, hundreds and hundreds of different divisions amongst the Amish. They won't talk to each other. Uh, every kind of perverse uh, sin you can imagine, because they're not born again. For the most of them are not born again. Some of them are. Don't get me wrong. But many of them are not born again. And uh, the, the, the people that have come against us the most are the religious leaders. Because they're, the, they're the leaders and they have something to lose. They, they're, they're fearful they're going to lose their leadership. And, um, you know, and all the perks that come with that, even though they want to appear so humble and so forth. Anyways, another category of religious leader that I am regularly persecuted by are the false grace preachers. Or the hyper grace Preachers, the one that are always, you know, saying that, you know, we're saved by grace. And so there's no component of holiness involved in salvation whatsoever. And the righteousness that God promises is only a legal righteousness, has nothing to do with how you actually live. Nothing could be further than the truth. That's heretical. It's actually blasphemous because it discounts the lordship of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I harp on this all the time. Regular viewers know that. And we get regular persecution from them. They write comments uh, to our YouTube videos that we make and try to prove us wrong. And, and they always have their scriptures, their proof texts, of course. But, you know, they'll take Galatians 2, but they forget about Galatians 5. <laughs> you know, and uh, God bless them. I hope I wouldn't want to be them standing for Jesus, having spent my 
quote-unquote ministry telling people that you don't have to obey Jesus or some of the worst perversions. You don't have to obey the commandments of Christ because, you know, we're under the new covenant and Jesus' commandments are all old covenant commandments, all this kind of nonsense, which, again, if you watch the lessons, you heard me say this. But we get regularly persecuted by them. It's part of the package. If you start teaching and embracing the true gospel, you're going to get persecuted, you know, to a degree from religious leaders. People are going to hell. And they call me a wolf in sheep's clothing and a false prophet because I say that, you know, there's a component of holiness that's necessary for salvation. Because Jesus said, you know, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. He said that within the context of a sermon that's full of commandments, you know. And so it's obvious to anyone who's honest. But we have these deceiving, dishonest people, ear ticklers who, you know, preach a false grace, a grace that's nothing more than a license to sin, a grace that is warned against time and time again in, in the New Testament. Jude, for example, warned against those who turn the grace of God into licentiousness. That's a license to sin. Okay, so anyways, the, the, Peter and John brought before the Sanhedrin and, you know, can't deny there's a miracle, but, and, and Peter boldly preaches. You know, it's Jesus. No other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Goes in one ear and out the other. Doesn't pierce their hardened religious hearts. And um, they threaten Peter and John, don't be, don't be preaching or teaching in the name of Jesus any longer. And they say, well, whether it's right, you know, you know, to obey you or God, you can be the judge of that, you know, dripping with sarcasm. And out they go. And once they leave the council, they go right to their companions. No, no doubt the church, at least part of the church, was gathered somewhere uh, praying for them because Peter and John, I mean, these are big guys in the church, are being brought before the religious leaders of Jerusalem, you know, the epicenter of Judaism. And, and uh, you know, so they were probably praying. But anyways, they come together and they pray and they quote from Psalm 2 about the foolishness of those who oppose Christ. And here our religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, are making that very mistake. They've aligned themselves against the Lord and against his Christ. And so, and, and oh, I, I should add that um, um, when they pray, it says they lifted their voices to God with one accord. Okay, so you want to experience the book of Acts? You, we got to break out of that prayer where one person prays while everyone else listens and we take turns praying and listening to each other pray. You know, think about that just for a moment. One person's praying and we're all listening to what they pray. Now, when I'm in those kind of settings, I often try to participate by agreeing verbally with their prayer. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. You know, because I'm, I'm not I'm not just sitting there listening to you pray. I'm praying to God. But I would love in those circles to get people to break out of that. And everyone, because we're praying, we are praying. We're not one of us praying, the rest of us listening to one of us pray and then taking turns. We're praying to God. So they lifted their voices to God with one accord. Everyone's praying at the same time and they're all praying out loud. And then what Luke gives us here is kind of like the gist of the, the prayers that are going up from everybody. There, there could have been thousands of people praying at once. And I've been in lovely meetings. It seems like this is practice, you know, overseas. And I've got a chance to travel for years and years and years around the world and experience this praying out loud, everybody all at one time. And it's marvelous. It's powerful, you know. And why not? We all sing at the same time, you know, but we're all singing the same words, usually when we're singing a hymn or something. But why can't everyone pray aloud? God can hear all our prayers. God's hearing everyone's prayers all around the world right now. God can listen to more than one prayer. Okay, so that's what they were doing. And uh, so anyways, we'll break into the gist of their prayer. For truly in this city, verse 27, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, and Pontius Pilate, oh, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. So I, I, I slightly stand corrected because I said in the previous little lesson that when uh, they quoted from the second Psalm here, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? Um, 
you know, they, they just come from not a Gentile meeting, but a Jewish meeting. Okay. And, but they're making reference to the fact that there were Gentiles who aligned themselves against the Christ, Herod and Pontius Pilate. They were both involved in the condemnation of Christ, along with Roman soldiers, along with the people of Israel. So it was a combined effort between Jew and Gentile to crucify Jesus. But look at this, along with Gentiles, the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. So overriding it all, even though these wicked, ungodly people are conspiring against Christ, there's still the overriding predestined plan of God. Now, they didn't try to figure that out. And I don't. I, ad, I advise you not to either, because you would never want to think, oh, God inspired Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Jewish leaders, as well as the Gentiles, to crucify Jesus. Okay? It was, you know, obviously it was, it was God's will for Jesus to suffer and die on the cross. But he didn't inspire the ones who, who were responsible for it. In fact, he held them accountable for it. Okay, so there's a bit of mystery there that's probably beyond our ability to really fathom how all that works. But what you don't want to do is, you know, make a wrong conclusion. Okay, you just had to change a battery that was going bad here. <laughs> don't make a wrong conclusion. Don't try to figure out what's impossible to, to figure out. Okay, it, it's beyond our comprehension. Just like, for example, there's lots of things that are beyond our comprehension. Like, can you understand no beginning and no end? That's totally beyond our finite minds. Okay, and so a lot of things in this area of what God predestines somehow working with the free will of people and God holding them accountable for the evil that they do, yet God predestining that evil to, to occur. Again, you know, I, I, I'm going to open up a can of worms, you know, if I just go too far, okay? We could say God allowing it to happen what he predestines. But again, you can see we're getting into very gray areas, okay? <laughs> so the, the, all of the people prayed, you know, they recognized that God's hand was, was in all this, but God's ultimately in control. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. I think the King James says, with all boldness, while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And so a lot we can learn at the end of yesterday's or previous little lesson, I encouraged all of us to be imitating this prayer, although I didn't mention that this prayer then, I will certainly mention it now. If we want to experience the book of Acts, we got to pray like they prayed. Was it? So, Lord, take note of their threats if, if, if you're being threatened, you know, for a bodily harm by your persecutors. I've never been threatened that way. I just get, you know, verbal abuse and so forth. But take note of their threats, Lord. Grant that thy bondservants might speak thy word with confidence. And so, that's the spiritual secret to boldness. It's God-given boldness. You can pray for boldness. You say, I'm a little bit scared, you know, to speak out the truth. Hey, welcome to reality. No, because none of us likes to be persecuted. No one wants to be hated. We all want to be loved. And so we naturally lean towards, you know, holding back. And, and you know, the flesh wants its comfort. We don't want to be persecuted. We don't want to be disliked. But pray that God will give you, grant you boldness to speak his word with confidence and boldly while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. I think every Christian around the world should be praying this prayer. Lord, let us give us boldness to speak your word and while you Heal people. 
and do signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Now, if you have the, if you're a false grace preacher and you're telling people that all they have to do is accept Jesus as their personal savior, you don't want to be praying this prayer. God's not hearing your prayers. <laughs> you know, you need to be born again and get accepted by Jesus rather than accepting Jesus and repent and believe in the Lord Jesus so that his Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you and then you'll know it. You'll be a new creation in Christ, you know, and, and then you, your whole life will change. Okay, um, but if you are one of those born-again people, pray this prayer and pr pray it, you know, as much as you can, all right? You know, Lord, grant that I would speak your word, but help me, make me bold. And God's able to make you bold, right? He can do anything. Beyond transcending your own ability. Just like God can give you words to speak, God can give you boldness beyond your own ability. And God can heal and do signs and wonders. And again, he, they, they didn't pray, Lord, use me. They said, Lord, just do it. Use whoever you want to use. I'm fine with that. And when they had prayed, oh boy, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. So, like a little earthquake. Can you imagine that? You know, you're in a prayer meeting, and all of a sudden, as, you, as your prayers are dying down, there's a shaking. <laughs> the, you know, God saying, hey, I'm the big, big, all-powerful God. I can shake anything I want to shake. And I'm shaking a lot of people's hearts. The place where they had gathered together was shaken. And look at this. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Everybody. God answered their prayer. God, make us bold. God said, I'm making you bold. You know, you think about why wouldn't God answer that prayer? When we talk about prayers, we're always talking about other things other than things that God is supremely interested in, it seems. Why don't we pray what God, what the things that God's interested in? God is interested in the gospel going forth. He needs people to tell that, tell the gospel boldly, right? And so why wouldn't God answer a sincere prayer? God, give me boldness to speak your word boldly. And what was the secret? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, these are, for the most part, all people who, as far as we know, had already been born again, so they have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. If they weren't there on the day of Pentecost, if they were there on the day of Pentecost, they were already filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with other tongues. And Peter had said, this promise is to you and to your children, to, as many, you know, to those who are far, as many as our Lord God shall call himself. So no doubt there were people who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit amongst the, the initial 3,000 people that were born again on the day of Pentecost. But here, again, a, a subsequent filling of the Holy Spirit that results in a filling to help them to be bold. Wow. There's one thing that separates the, the Church of the Book of Acts from the modern church. It's that component. It's the component of the Holy Spirit working in our life, even in things that are not as spectacular as signs and wonders, but still are just as much supernatural. The ability for timid and shy and fearful people to not be timid and shy and fearful any longer, but to have boldness and to speak the word of God boldly. And of course, that's going to result in people are not going to like you. You're going to be persecuted. But it's also going to mean you're going to get the attention of people whose hearts are soft, who's, who are, you know, even either open or beginning to open. And because Jesus taught us there's four different kinds of soil. And there's only one of those four is the good soil. The other three soils, lousy soil. And that represents all of human hearts. And so you have to take the good with the bad soil you got. You find yourself sowing the seed, and a lot of it, sadly, tragically, falls on hard soil or rocky soil or soil that, you know, there's weeds growing up with the good plants and so forth. Only one out of four soils is the good soil. But you got to sow the seed. And so you got to preach it boldly. Okay? So that's the secret to spiritual boldness is the Holy Spirit and 
the means to that is prayer. Lord, help me to be bold. Help me to be bold with your word. That's a great prayer. Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me and of my word, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of the angels. So we should be opposed to timidity regarding the word of God. Okay, now finally in chapter 4, um, we find a description, a general description of what characterized the early church. If we want to experience the book of Acts, then we ought to be looking at these things and looking at us and see how that comparison goes. And um, again, we see this koinonia, the, the sharing of all things, holding all things in common. Again, kept keeping in mind the context of their day that, you know, they didn't own near the things that most of us take for granted owning automobiles, cameras, lawnmowers, you know, tools and kitchen utensils and washing machines and, you know, all these things that are part of life today. The, the people back then, it was, it was, you know, much more limited as to what people owned. Yeah, owned a house, owned land, owned some fairly primitive tools by our standards, primitive furniture by our standards, okay? And, you know, Solomon would give everything he owned to live in our e era and have what we have, okay, as far as possessions are concerned. But here in, in Acts 4.32, the sharing of the possessions was the mostly the sharing of the basics, the food for needy people who needed food. And again, that's another thing that's foreign to so many of us in the wealthy countries where we live. Um, I don't think that lets us off the hook. I think we ought to be thinking about our brothers and sisters around the world who have more of a biblical context where food security is a problem. You know, um, I always uh, advertise Heaven's Family, the ministry which I founded about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years now. And we've done projects in, I think, 60 different countries, and it's mostly amongst uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ who are not only facing the very daunting challenges of poverty, but food security in many cases. Probably our most successful program to solve that problem is something called Farming God's Way, where we'll teach failing subsistence farmers how to increase the productivity of their soil, prove their soil, and do a better job at taking care of their growing crops. And we can promise them that if you will follow the instructions, your very next harvest will be at least two, usually three to four times better harvest than you've ever had in your life. And so the first time in their lives, these very poor failing subsistence farmers have money, that uh, discretionary money, because they have more crops than what they can consume in a year, and so they have crops to sell. And so they sell them and they have money. And it's a great way to help people lift themselves out of poverty. And we've actually already done that now as I'm speaking to you. It probably with, uh, oh, I bet, um, you know, tens of thousands of failing subsistence farmers teaching them farming God's way. And we couple it with a disciple-making church planting ministry. So at the same time, disciples are being multiplied. And it's a lovely thing. You can learn about it if you go to heavensfamily.org and type in farming God's way. But it's one way that people like me and you that are living in wealthy countries where we're parts of churches where there aren't people who really need food. Okay. And if there are, they, they go to the food bank, you know. Uh, but, but there's so many social services and so forth here by comparison to other, you know, in developing countries and so forth. It's just all completely, completely different. And so anyways, we, we talk about the sharing of, 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 of possessions, you know, you know, if someone's homeless, you, you said, I was a stranger, you invited me in, so you're sharing your home. You know, you can sleep over there. Sharing our food. You know, we, we 
can't care for the widows. That's found in the early church. See, it was the basic things. It wasn't the, you know, hey, do you want to borrow my my uh, my BMW to go out, you know, and take a weekend off and go tour the countryside? That's not what you're talking about in the sharing concept here. Just keep that in mind, okay? Acts 4.32, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and, and soul. Beautiful unity. Of course, they were fighting over pet doctrines and dividing up. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. There it is, the sharing, koinonia. Praise God. I, I think I'm going to stop here and just focus for a, a short time before we close on this. All those who believe were of one heart and one soul. There's something about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ that binds your heart together with other true believers, even if you don't agree with everything doctrinally, for example, with them. We know we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. God's love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, Romans 5, 5. And again, we know we pass from death to life because we love the brethren, 1 John 3, 14. So that's part of the supernatural work. You have a supernatural love for the brethren. So if you're at animosity with other Christians, that would show that either you or they are not Christians. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because love for the brethren is part of the package. And when you're slandering people and publicly saying lies about them, like there's this guy, a couple of people, you know, they're always out there t talking about me in public forums, saying I'm a wolf in sheep's clothing, I'm a false prophet, and so forth, because I teach that, you know, holiness is a, a requirement for heaven. And, and, and these people absolutely hate me. They, like, they gossip me every opportunity they get. I mean, I see their public stuff. Imagine what they're saying in private about me. They hate me. Could those people possibly be born again? Not according to the Bible. You're just a church person. You're a religious person. You embraced a, a you know, a, a, a what you call Christianity, but which is not Christianity because Jesus is not your Lord. You don't believe in Jesus. You don't believe in the Lord Jesus. You've carved an idol and called him Jesus. But the proof of it all is you hate me. Why aren't you coming to me to try to help me see the error of my ways? And we have a discussion from the Bible. And you point out your proof text, and I'll show you all the texts that contradict your interpretation of your proof text. Why aren't we working together to, to arrive at truth? Why are you just constantly saying evil about, speaking evil about me. I'll tell you why, because you're not born again. You don't know Jesus. And, the, and these, the, these leaders of denominations that divide up over doctrine and announce it to the world, put signs in front of their churches identifying which kind of Christian they are by their doctrinal distinctives? How does that fit into this? That's why I've never joined a, a denomination. I've been a Christian and in the ministry for, you know, decades, almost five decades. And I've never joined a denomination because it's contrary to the Word of God. Dividing from other Christians because of doctrine. You know, again, I understand separating yourselves from heretics whose, whose, whose doctrine is heretical. But doctrinal distinctives? or things about church, you know, how, how church is done, and announcing to the whole world that we're not like them? Don't, don't confuse us with those kind of Christians? How does that fit into the New Testament? How does that fit into this? You want a, new, you want a book of Acts Church? Get rid of that name. Get out of that, you know, division within the body of Christ, if you're even in the body of Christ. Again, I think a lot of these denominations, they're not even Christians. Again, they just, you know, it's just a religious organization. Might have started off as Christian, but they're so far from the Bible nowadays that don't resemble anything what they used to be. And I can understand why they divide, because they're not born again. But when you're born again, you're of one heart and one soul with the other born again people. It comes as a part of the package. <laughs> okay, all right. 
You want the experience book of Acts? You can't be a part of a denomination, okay? Dividing yourself up from other people who, who are true Christians. All right, that's enough for today. If you're looking for more controversial but biblical teaching, why don't you check out davidservant.org. davidservant.org. Decades of teaching we've compiled there on multiple biblical subjects. You may not agree with all of it, but it'll provoke you to think, okay? Because we always try to stick with Scripture and all of Scripture rather than just, you know, yanking out little parts and saying, here's what the Bible says. DavidServant.org. Until next time, may the Lord continue to bless you as you continue to follow Him. Mm -hmm.